Ladies and gentlemen, ever since it was realized that our energy resources are finite, scientists have been on the search for that all-elusive silver bullet to solve our energy woes. However, the scientific community at large, government agencies and the general public who are skeptical even at the best of times, are quickly realizing that there is no perfect solution. Many new technologies do show great promise, but I strongly believe that we risk marginalizing existing methods of energy generation, which when we should be extracting from them all that we can. Over the next 10 minutes or so, I wish to discuss three examples of recent technology re realizing the full potential of current implementations. I will begin by considering the coupling of nuclear energy and drinking water. Then I will shift focus onto carbon dioxide, examining first its conversion into biofuels by living organisms, and then considering how integration of cement production and power generation can reduce the emissions of both processes. So, let's begin with water. Currently, 40 million cubic meters of potable water are produced by desalination every day, causing an incredible drain on fossil fuel resources. The low carbon alternative, nuclear powered desalination, has for a long time been hampered by cost, but the rising price of fossil fuels is leading to a resurgence in interest. Nuclear energy can be utilized in two ways. Either dedicated nuclear plants can be constructed to produce energy solely for desalination, or just a portion of a larger nuclear plant's capacity can be directed towards water processing. I'll consider two main desalinating techniques. The first is reverse osmosis, for which seawater is subjected to very high pressures in a unit with a semi-permeable membrane. Only water molecules pass through that membrane, thereby isolating pure water. Nuclear's role in reverse osmosis would be to provide electricity for the main osmotic pressure pump. Compared to fossil fuels, nuclear could cut energy costs by a third. Secondly, there is multiple effect distillation, or MED. With this process, seawater is heated directly by steam. The water vapor moves to a cooler chamber, where it vaporizes yet more seawater and itself condenses into pure water. The second batch of vapor moves to a cooler chamber still, and thus the process continues. MED is the preferred option for a wide range of future projects, as it is reliable, operates at low temperature, and requires no seawater pretreatment. Of particular intrigue, though, is the current Russian scheme to mass produce floating nuclear power plants. These plants can be coupled with desalination setups, and the first of seven will be deployed in 2012. It certainly is an ideal example, I believe, of the potential for imaginative, beneficial couplings between nuclear power and desalination schemes. For the rest of my presentation, I wish to focus on carbon dioxide, starting with fossil fuel plants. The amount of carbon dioxide emitted by the UK power sector is alarming, comprising over a quarter of our total greenhouse gas emissions. The main culprit is fossil fuel, the source of the vast majority of our fuel for vehicles and power in general. Tackling this dependence has long been a research focus, but various attempts have had insurmountable issues. First generation biofuels rely on edible food crops, algae, can be fed industrial flue gases in an inline, fully integrated arrangement, as shown schematically here. Organic matter remaining at the end of the process can be reutilized by means of microbial decomposition and subsequent combustion. There are three stages to go from industrial waste gas to marketable biodiesel, algae cultivation, oil extraction, and oil processing. The first stage involves the conversion of sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water into oil. Algae can produce up to 40% of their own body mass in oil, storing it within their cells. Next, the oil is harvested by one of two methods. Filtration of the algae from the reaction mixture is very, very cheap, but also very slow, whereas high-tech, high-cost centrifugation leads to three isolable fractions, the all-important oil, reusable growth medium, and biodegradable algal slurry, which can be recycled or sold as fertilizer. The isolated oil contains various triglycerides. These undergo a transesterification reaction, leading to the desired ester products, ready to be refined into biodiesel. Pilot projects in fields already far surpassing those of second generation crops have produced usable fuel. For example, a Ford pickup truck has been successfully powered by 100% algal biodiesel, impressively without a single modification. And in 2009, a Boeing 737 flew a two-hour flight powered by a mix of standard and algal diesels. However, algal biodiesel does not come cheap. 
Solix Biofuels, an American firm, currently spends six pounds to make just one litre of algal biodiesel. Upon industrial scale up, it projects a reduced cost of 61 pence per litre. Even if all organic byproducts were sold, the net cost of 29 pence per litre is still almost double the cost of producing diesel from fossil fuels. Clearly, there is still some way to go before algal fuel is truly commercially viable. So, what next? One US company, Juul Unlimited, has developed a range of genetically modified cyanobacteria, which produce alkanes instead of triglycerides. These alkanes require much less processing to be turned into biodiesel. Further, the genetic modifications cause the cyanobacteria to secrete rather than accumulate these alkenes, which float to the top of the reactor ready for direct collection. This eliminates the need for expensive centrifugation. Better still, a side product of this entire process is oxygen. Cyanobacteria may do more than just make biofuel, they may clean up our environment too. From one serial CO2 polluter then to another, the cement industry, I was shocked to read that for every ton of concrete produced, approximately the same mass of, approximately the same mass of carbon dioxide is released into our atmosphere. A significant proportion of these emissions stems from the initial combustion stage of cement manufacture. <coughs> Calcium oxide, a compound comprising two-thirds of most cement mixes, is produced from the thermal decomposition of calcium carbonate, otherwise known as limestone. This decomposition has just one product, carbon dioxide, but there is little scope for reducing the amount of it produced in the, pro in the process. It's just basic chemistry. To reduce the environmental impact of this step then, waste gases produced simply cannot be emitted. One approach is carbon capture and sequestration, or CCS, looping. Limestone decomposes in a process known as calcination, forming carbon, uh, carbon dioxide and calcium oxide. In a separate reactor, that calcium oxide is reacted with flue gases, reforming limestone. This process, carbonation, is exothermic. That is, it releases heat energy which can be used to generate power. This highly dynamic process concentrates the carbon dioxide stream to 95%, then suitable for CCS. Spent calcium oxide is used as a feedstock for the cement process stage. Such deep integration yields very impressive results. The calcium oxide for the cement process is decomposed in the calcium loop, eliminating the release of carbon dioxide associated with this process. The power plant itself is decarbonized, as its emissions are almost all captured by CCS. And, unlike other CCS techniques, which can cause an energy efficiency drop of up, up, upwards of 10%, calcium looping has been shown to reduce energy efficiency by just 3. In fact, if every coal-fired power station in the UK today were fitted with a cement plant and calcium looping facility, these plants alone would produce 33 million tonnes of cement per year, more than double the UK's current 12.5 million tonne output. The real-world union of cement production, CCS and calcium looping really could make a marked difference. I hope that I have managed to demonstrate the coupling of current technologies with new innovations and how it can really enhance our present day energy sector. Whether solving the world's water woes, using bacteria to make biofuels, or coupling cement oh, uh, yeah, sorry, or coupling cement with carbon capture, merely creating new ideas is not sufficient. It is the integration of these ideas, old and new, that will provide the key to our sustainable future. Thank you. Please. Just what's your speciality? Are you specialising in one field, or is it just all? I'm actually I actually 